and I was never in the presence of a bomb. I grew up in Southern California. My father built atomic and nuclear bombs. He would take uranium from Oak Ridge, Tennessee and move it to Los Alamos, New Mexico. He built the first plutonium plant and transported the plutonium to Los Alamos as part of the Manhattan Project, building the world's first bombs. This is the bombing of Hiroshima, and I was born seven months after the bombing with plutonium poisoning, but nobody knew about it. I didn't know about my father's work until both my parents died, and I inherited these certificates. I thought each certificate was one bomb, and then I got on the internet and did research, and that totaled 131 nuclear explosions that my father watched. This is from the National Geographic, and that's my father leaning forward. So he would wear dark glasses and watch these bombs explode. He had VIP seating to watch 131 nuclear explosions. And here I am, I'm the little one. And that's before my father left for 13 months to go build the world's <coughs> first hydrogen bomb. He traveled a lot. But all of my life, everything was top secret, and we couldn't talk about much in our family. So this is the world's first hydrogen bomb, and it was a thousand times more powerful than the bomb bomb dropped on Hiroshima. So I grew up in 1950s during the Cold War, and my best friend up the street had a bomb shelter, and we would go play in the bomb shelter. And I didn't understand how adults thought, because we were supposed to hide in the bomb shelter for a few days and then come out. But I, as a small child, could see this radiation going in this cloud. And I could see it going on the earth. I could see it getting in the water. I could see this radiation getting in our food. And I didn't understand it. So when I was five years old, one night at dinner, I said, who will clean up the mess? And I was sent to my room. The only time in my life I was ever sent to my room. And throughout my childhood, I was always sick. Everybody in my family was sick. My father would go build bombs, and then he would bring the radiation home with, with him. I always had a headache. I threw up a lot. I would pass out a lot. When I was your age as a teenager, the doctor would come to the house and shoot me up with morphine. I was in such pain. So it was not a fun thing to live with radiation. So I started trying to get better and getting tested to see what was wrong with me. And when I was 26 years old, I had my first moment of no headache. So I called up all my friends and I said, do you have a headache? I call up another friend going, do you have a headache? And everybody would say no. I had no concept that everybody didn't have a headache. I thought everybody had a headache and it was just something we weren't allowed to talk about. Since everything was so top secret, you know, I assumed that everybody else felt like I did, but I didn't know that. So it was quite an amazing journey. And then for about 40 or 50 years, I would wake up in the night screaming in terror. I'd have these outrageous nightmares and um, lots of nights screaming. So finally, when I was 52 years old, I was finally diagnosed with plutonium poisoning. And what that feels like, it feels like rusted barbed wire is being ripped through your brains. It feels like hot molten lava is flowing down your legs. It's incredibly painful. So what the, I got chelation, and chelation was shots. And I get shots all around my head, behind my eyes, in my lungs, down my back. 
all throughout my whole body, down my, even in between my toes. And each one of the shots was incredibly painful. And I got a hundred shots once a week. And I had that, I would go once a week for a year and a half to get a hundred shots. During this time, I started painting. I would wake up in the night and these colors were just, I just had to paint. So I do this art with my hands as the radiation was coming out of my body. Ten years after I did the paintings, I found the declassified photos on the internet of the bombs that my father built and watched explode. And I was shocked to see the similarities between my art and the bombs that my father created. So this is one of my art and this is one of the bombs. This is the bomb. <coughs> that was so I did paintings ten years before I saw any of the bombs. And that's when the, the island disappeared completely. And when I did this piece of art, I had to put a circle around it. So the South Pacific Proving Ground, where my father was the person there, there were 67 nuclear tests. And the radiation from that was more than 7,000 Hiroshima bombs. And this is a map of the United States. They did a lot of testing in Nevada. And the fallout has covered the entire United States. There's no area that hasn't been covered. And since that um, thyroid cancer has been on the increase, and thyroid cancer is four times more prevalent in women than in men. And this is a map of the atomic tests throughout the world. There have been 2,053 nuclear explosions. So you can see that radiation is all over the world. The physical effects of nuclear radiation are vomiting, diarrhea, headache. It affects your brain, your blood system, your heart. And it also leads to cancer. It leads to leukemia, which my father died of, bladder cancer, breast, stomach, lung, brain, and thyroid cancer. And we all know that cancer is on the rise but not many people are talking about radiation and cancer. So the psychological effects of radiation are depression, anxiety, fear and stress, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So plutonium is a man-made substance, and at its very core, it's annihilating and destructive. And what that happens when it's in your body leads to self-hatred and self-annihilation and shame and guilt. It makes you feel like unlovable scum. So when I was 60, I put everything in storage because I was moving and I went camping for the weekend. And then I went to town and realized that all of my life savings disappeared in the stock market. I also found out that almost everything I owned was stolen from the storage. And at this point I was still in massive pain and I figured out the perfect way to commit suicide. So I talked to my sister and she could totally understand what was going on because she was also in pain. And the pain is like this electroshock in the back of my neck. And it was kind of like a cattle prod or some massive electric thing happening. And that had been going on for 60 years. And at that point, I was just ready to be done. I didn't want to live anymore. And this is a cattle prod. So it was kind of like this electric thing happening in my neck. So one day, this energy just came up inside and said, choose gratitude. I thought, well, I have absolutely nothing to lose, so why not give that a try? And what I realized was, you can either be in gratitude or you can be in pain, but you can't be in both at the same moment. 
So I started spinning gratitude throughout the pain in my neck and started thanking it. And it made absolutely no logical sense, but it started working. So I started thanking all this pain, and as I did, it started to change. And after a few months, this electroshock in the back of my neck finally left after 60 years from my thanking it. So I decided to learn more about how your brain works. And we have an ancient reptilian brain, which is about 500 million years old. And this part of your brain is triggered by fear. And then above that is your limbic system. And your limbic system is your emotions. And it's about seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. And then on top of that is your neocortex. And that's the newest part of your brain. That's only about 2.6 million years old. And that's the part of your brain that learns language and mathematics. It's the part that has logic. This is the part of your brain that creates music and creates art. But if you bring in gratitude and thank all the fear that's happening, the fear starts to calm down. And as the fear calms down, then there are more neural connections that go to the newer parts of your brain. This is a survival mechanism of how our bodies are hardwired. The, so we have three main survival mechanisms. There's the fight, which is physical fighting or verbally attacking. Flight, which is when we run away or emotionally shut down. And freeze is when we become immobilized or we try to make ourselves really small. So whenever any of these parts of your brain are triggered, they take over. So this is a picture I took in Mexico and it's kind of how our brains look inside. They're all jangled up. So sometimes you might get nervous or afraid when you're taking a test or maybe when you're riding on the subway and that will tr trigger your ancient reptilian brain and you just can't think clearly. So whenever that happens, if you start to thank that part of your body, it will start to shift. So whenever you get afraid, just thank the fear. I know it seems unlogical, but if you thank your fear, that will shift. And as that changes, you'll make no more new neural connections in your brain and you can start thinking more clearly. So the high frequency of gratitude would be like a frequency up here in physics. And anger or fear is a very low frequency. As you bring in this higher frequency, it raises your anger or your fear up to a different level. So you have a different feeling and your brain works differently. So I know a lot of this talk about radiation brings in a lot of fear. And then atomic radiation comes from bombs, and it also comes from nuclear power plants, as we heard earlier. So this is a map of Chernobyl and all the radiation that happened after that incident. And then here we have a map of Fukushima, Japan, which was the year ago. And the radiation, this was just a few days after Fukushima and the radiation that was happening then. Now we are a year later, and the fallout is a hundred times higher than it was last September. There's several radioactive leaks into the sea. The radiation levels in Southern California in the seaweed is 500% higher. And milk all across the United States is 2,000% higher in radiation levels than the accepted levels. So what the EPA has decided to do is just raise the acceptable radiation levels. So they've decided that radiation can be higher. So the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. And half-life means the time it takes for something to dissolve by half. 
Plutonium is a man-made substance. It's not naturally occurring in nature. And it's made by splitting the nucleus of the atom of uranium. And when that happens, it gives off tremendous heat and tremendous energy. As Nelson Mandela has said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So after Fukushima, I was talking to my friends, and all of them, it's like their minds went blank. And I was stunned, and I realized they were all in a state of fear and panic. And when you're in that state of panic, you can't think clearly. So I realized how important it is to learn to bring gratitude to your brain so that you can think. As Einstein says, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So it's important to start thinking with our new brains rather than a brain in fear. So as we bring peace inside of each one of our brains and each one of our nervous systems, we can start to come up with new solutions. And you all hold the solutions and the key to our future. And I know that each one of you is absolutely brilliant. And as you bring in thanks to whatever's happening in your life, things can shift. So what can you do? When fear arises, you can take a deep breath and just thank the fear. Because I know we all experience fear. You can start a radiation detection program in your school. You can start to tell your friends all about this on the internet through blogs and Twitter. So you can also choose to be the change you wish to be, see, as Gandhi has said. Change starts with each one of us. As we create change, as we come together, we can create a better world for each one of us. But it takes all of us together working. So I thank you for your brilliance and for your intelligence. And I thank you for listening to our talk. Blessings. You know, something else just popped into my mind as, as Dr. Miller was talking. And she said something about a radiation detective detection club, which sounds so, I don't know, out there. And yet, did you know that there's an app for that? You can, <laughs> you can actually get an app for a Geiger counter. You can detect, you can get an app that will help use, you, use your iPhone or your smartphone to detect radiation. So you can become radiation detectors with an app. It's a, it's, and do you know why that, do you know why that exists? Think of Japan and the past year with the people in Japan have been going through. People in Japan suddenly want to know how much radiation is in their food, how much radiation is in their water, how much radiation is in their backyard and their trees. And so, you know, a lot of te technology is developed in Japan. They developed an app for your iPhone so that you can actually, um, and it's available here. See if you have questions to either Dr. Cynthia Miller or Toshiko Sai. Um, Think of the testimonies that she gave, and think of what went through your mind at that time, um, or the presentation just now about radiation. Any questions? Something you'd like to know about backgrounds? Something you'd like to know about? Yes. Hi. Hi. Yes. Um, I wanted to know if it still affects the radiation yes. or the, uh, the experience? Um, both. both. Do, does the radiation and the ex does the whole experience still affect you now? I'm a school kid, I'm a little bit of 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 a uh, yes, well, number one, because I looked at the, the plane as the, the bombs were bomb was dropped, 
So my eyes got really affected from it, and so I went to the major operation to replace my lens, and also my knees are really weak on, which I also went through operation on. Um, and I get really tired easily, but I keep my spirit high so I can, you know, I can be happy. lot of pain and I also have very weak bones. I've broken lots of bones in my body so I have to be careful about that. Um, and there isn't a moment of my life that hasn't been affected by nuclear radiation. everything several years ago. Yes, I was 60 years old and I was living in a tent in the mountains in the wilderness. <laughs> How did you get here today? Just from then? From living in a tent to New York City? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. There's been lots of things that have happened along the way. Um, the major thing that happened was I have a PhD in psychology and I went to volunteer, I went to town and to volunteer at a women's um, center to work with women who'd been sexually abused. And after I volunteered, the woman said, what can I do for you? And I was stunned that she asked me that. And I said, well, I would love to house sit for someone. And two days later, this amazing woman called and wanted me to house sit in this multi-mansion, million dollar mansion. And so, and then she found out that I had no place to live and they gave me part of their house to live in. And the part they gave me was three bedrooms, three bathrooms, and a living room and dining room. So I went from a tent to this amazing place. <laughs> I was wondering, for those six years afterwards, after the bomb, that nobody really knew what was going on, what did, did anybody have any ideas or think of what was happening? What was happening during the six years after the bomb fell, <laughs> when nobody seemed to know what was going on? あの、um, those six years particularly, I think it was the same for Hiroshima, but also Nagasaki as well, we pretty much lost everything, houses and everything, and you know, our, where all of us are really ill. So really, we were struggling with our daily life, rather, like, you know, we were, some, like, we had to eat the grass on the side of the street, like, we didn't have anything to eat, and so really, we didn't have really room to think about, like, the bigger picture of what was really happening. Other questions? Um, what compelled you to like do your own research and actually go out and tell other people about your story? To both speakers, what compelled you to do research and then go out and tell your story? Well, it was something I didn't want to talk about ever. And this week is the first week I've ever spoken formally to anyone about it. So th this is the third day, it's why I'm a little nervous. Um, and I did research, especially after I inherited those certificates that you saw, because that was really valid information that my father had built the bombs. I knew he worked with something, but it was also top secret. I didn't really know what he did. So after both my parents died, and I could research on the internet. So that's when I started learning more about it. So it's been a puzzle of trying to figure out what my life has been about. And 
and I thought I would never want to share anything because it was been so scary. So this is very new for me to share it with you. あの、あまりその so I feel the same way about Dr. Mueller actually for a long time. I didn't really want to talk about it because there's no advantage for me to really talk about it. It only hurts me. And so, but um, three years ago, I started going around on this um, cruise ship called Peaceful, which is a, a Japan-based non-profit organization that goes around the world to promote peace. And I... We went to a lot of um, places in the world that have gone through wars and and a lot of poor countries, a lot of them were. And there I met a lot of young children who also went through the wars, and but they're still trying to live their everyday life as much as they can. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe I only have another 10 more years in my life where I can actually go around the world and share my stories. So while I can, I really want to share my stories with the younger people like you guys and yeah, and give you the opportunity to hear my stories as well and share the stories. We don't have any more time for your question, but you, do, you can certainly come up and ask it in person, okay? But I do sure, want to, before we end, um, to hold up the center and present you with some gifts for your school from us. Uh, well, these are half of a thousand cranes. Let's see, they're all in here. We have a thousand well, cranes for you. You can oh, ask for after. And the cranes were made by children. Um, I believe from here. Why is individually made with all these? If those of you who are familiar with the story of Sadako, who built, made a thousand cranes as a way to get a wish, the Japanese, uh, you know, maybe you can explain the Japanese tradition of a thousand cranes. So the tradition is that, especially for somebody who's dying or who has a very strong wish, you make these um, paper cranes, and if you make one thousand of them, the you know we believe that your your wishes come true. So this little girl Sadako, she was dying of leukemia and she started hoping and making these sent out 1,000 paper cranes in the hope that she will survive. I mean, unfortunately she passed, she passed away, but... Yeah. And she was a classmate of yours? Yes, yes, yes. She went to the same, same school, but, but she was four years younger than Toshiko. Oh, yeah. Um, the other gift here is something special. These are seeds. These seeds come from a tree that actually survived Hiroshima. And they will grow, because I have some growing on my back patio. And um, there's, there are trees that survive. And these seeds, we'd like you to try to plant them. We have a garden up on the roof. We'll go put them up in the garden and on the roof. We'll see if they grow there. Instructions here how to grow them. And um, hopefully you will one day have a tree here that comes from Oh, isn't this amazing? Isn't it amazing? If you have a Facebook page and you are writing about this on your Facebook page, have page printed out and bring it to me of what you wrote about this experience on Facebook. You print out a half page of, of what you did, you can do that instead, and I will also take a look at what you posted on Facebook so you can spread the word about what you heard today. called Radiance Project. So I want you to post on the Radiance Project your homework.
Can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. Like, Enter an affirmation. Like yeah. uh, Radiance what Project, it? it's on Facebook. Facebook. Um, so if you don't, you got to do the deal at homework. That's what the deal is. Uh, and that's fine too. Um, so thank you everybody. Ms. Johnson will collect your feedback sheets so as you can leave and go to your next class. You're a great audience. One, two, three.